Over 200 experts have shared their secrets to a successful business. Join me, Rose Davidson, as I discover how these experts took their businesses to the next level. Talking with the experts. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. Talking about all things business by business owners for business owners. Episode 239 and my guest is Ross Davies. Um, I think a lot of that will come down to like the culture of the business. Like I can appreciate that, you know, I've probably been in companies beforehand where it was all like looking out for yourself. So therefore, well, I'll hold that together. I figured this thing out. So I'll just hold on to that because that will get me further in the business. Whereas if you're naturally in a company where people are constantly sharing ideas and processes on oh, jump in and do this with me, I think a lot of that will naturally breed. Now, you'll probably still end up with one or two people who will just hoard information and keep it to themselves. But uh, for us anyway, that's probably not the sort of person that we want working at Strafe. Um, so that's one part. And then the second part is, which probably ties a little bit in with this, is just it's almost making sure that person feels supported to be able to, to provide some of that information. If they constantly just feel like they're being taken advantage of or they're the only person that can do it, if you know there's only one person that can do it and you never go to them to try eke it out of them, like understandably, they'll probably just hold on to it even more because they're like, wow, well, you can never get rid of me. Talking with the experts. Hello and welcome to Talking with the Experts. Talking with the Experts is about all things business by business owners for business owners. I'm Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com, your host for today's episode. And my guest is Ross Davies, and he is the owner of Strafe Creative, a digital design agency focused on conversion um, led design. Growing up alongside the web, led Ross to be fascinated by technology and design, yet he started his career as an ergonomics engineer in the automotive industry. The culmination of his experience and passions led to the realisation his skills were transferable and thus Strafe Creative was born. Hello, Ross, and welcome for joining, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, hello, and obviously thank you so, so much for having me. That was that was a an impressive introduction. So, yeah, thank you very oh, much. I'm That's didn't write it, so yeah. I'm fine. I think Victoria <laughs> probably did. <laughs> Perfect. No, but no, it was great. So thank you, and obviously thank you for having me as well. Yeah, and you're also an author of Paper Plane Plan. Perhaps we'll go into that first, and then um, you can explain to our listeners what exactly that is about. Yeah, of course. So um, we work with, I guess, you know, we work with a broad range of type of client from, you know, we might be working with a local accountant to try and make them bring in more leads. We might be working with an e-commerce company because we want to drive up the number of sales that that company is making. But then another area that we do a lot of work in is a, like a SaaS or a tech company where they're trying to just get additional new users onto their account. And there's lots of, you know, there's lots of areas around what is growth hacking. Um, and there's lots of areas that can be done really well in tech because lots of it can be automated. Um, and lots of it, I guess you can trial and error and because all of your user and all of your information that's happening with your users is consistently online. And I guess one of the things that, you know, I don't run a tech company. I run essentially a service industry. You know, we, we create, uh, create design. So we started looking at some of those techniques and thinking, OK, well, how could we apply those into a more uh, B2B or a service based company? And then the more that we did, the more I started writing them out so that I could kind of um, be sure to kind of remember how to do them. And then if any of my friends who also own agencies um, wanted to kind of work on any of those, I could just kind of pass them over. And then over time, someone was like, we should make this into a book. And I was like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be quite cool. I should, I should give that a go. So I, I did the old classic kind of Parkinson's law. And um, I mean, again, we self-published, right? So um, I just basically put a launch date of when it was going to launch online. And then that gave me a year to get it done. Um, and then I just worked through, slowly got it done. Obviously, I had to get a copywriter to re-review it because I would honestly have to say I don't think my written word is possibly the best in the world. Um, and then we launched and we went from there, really. So, yeah, it was exciting yeah. to do. Yeah. Very impressive. Anyone that self-publishes a book, I reckon, um, you know, 
got rocks in their head personally, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a it's a long road, it's a long process. I think to self publish, um, so I understand anyway. So yeah, I think um, I'd rather get someone to do it for me, although it does cost an arm and a leg. So yeah, that's that's the downside of it. Yeah, yeah, of course, you you do have to consider some of those things, but but um, yeah, I guess the way we've ended up doing it is is more on a cost per print basis. So the book is obviously more expensive, but I don't have to have lots of stock laying around. It's, it's kind uh, of the way that we've done it. Good thing. That's a good, that's a good one. Yeah, to yeah. Do it. Yes. Upstairs for thinking and downstairs for dancing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> All right. So you, um, your company or you yourself, you try to find ways to improve processes. And um, so whether, you know, it's in your business or you're designing it for somebody else, can you just explain um, how you go about doing that? Mm. So, I think everything that we everything that we try to do at Strafe is, um, I guess, is a, is about constantly trying to just refine something, and it's taken something called a, a kaizen approach, which is actually from a, again, going back to my, uh, my my car days when I was in kind of manufacturing, is about just that continuous improvement. How can we get there? And obviously, the only way you can really continuously improve something is is to literally get it written down and get it all planned out. So normally, what happens is. We start to figure something out. Uh, obviously, being designers, we're all very visual. So the, the best thing that we would normally do is flow chart everything out and try to think about where everything goes. And actually, that's probably one of the big kind of things that I would always say to anyone is, once you've got it down visually, it's so much easier for you to say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why do we do that? And why does that come in here? And then as we've grown, we've had additional kind of staff join. And then they'll look at it and be like, why are we doing it that way? And it's like, well, that worked really well. We had five of us. Obviously, we didn't consider that when there was 15, 20 of us. So it's sort of that basis of being able to rework through something and figure it out. And it also means that when something does go wrong, we're able just to pull those straight out and go, okay, where do we improve? What could be better? Um, and obviously, there's more work that then has to go into it because we obviously have to plan out the, any, if there is any automation and build additional processes around those. But it all comes back to, for me anyway, and that's what I always start with, is, is just those flow, those kind of flow charts for us to figure everything out. Yeah, I, I like flow charts. I think they're really great because to me, I'd rather look at a flow chart than read, yeah. you know, a 20-page document because it gets boring after about the first five lines. <laughs> yeah, it's just easier to absorb, isn't it? And you, and you remember it. Absolutely, so, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's easier to refer to if you if if you're new to an organisation. I, I loved it when um, some of the jobs I went into as a temp, and they actually had a flow chart when I could just do each task by following the chart. But having to read the written one, it was a lot. Um, it wasn't hard. It was just more time consuming, I think, and because I learn visually as well. So yeah, it's so it was yes. good for me. It's definitely a better way of doing it. The, the other part that we do is that we don't have any, you, you, Rose, you'll be able to come work with us, you'd love it. So there's no, um, we don't have any written processes down, everything's video based. So you've got the pro, you've got the flow chart and then each individual part of the, the flow, as it, as it were, has a video attached so that you can watch the video and you can see it in real time being done. And rather than us ever just recording them as a tutorial, the way that we try to do them is, Someone just records their screen and does the thing that they were going to do anyway, but just verbalizes it so it makes sense. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of written notes either. And also, they're really hard to maintain, where it's a quick re record of a video. Is, yeah, is quite it, is. it is these days. Yeah, not compared to how yeah. it used to be like years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You can just do it on your phone now. So, yeah, mm. I think um, that's a really great uh, thing too about having the, the flow chart with um, video referencing to it and you just click on a link and just takes you to a video. And, you know, because some people are, you know, vis visual and um, and uh, they learn by listening. So it, it yes. just depends on what type of learner you are. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, that works best for you. So that's a really great system, I think, that uh, you, you've organised there. I think I'll oh, come and do my stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I can give you all the softwares and stuff as well. You can include those in the Yay. notes as well if you wanted to. So, yeah, it's all good. More than happy to do that. Yeah, so can, how can a business then, um, you know, you know, they probably have to be in business for a couple of years to know that their systems aren't working. So how can they go from, you know, unworking systems that are, you know, long and tedious to something that's a bit more concise and a bit more um, easier to handle? Mm. Not gonna lie to you, Rose. I'm not sure I have a um, perfect answer for that, but I can kind of explain how we do it. So, um, 
We have a system that basically anytime something goes wrong in the business, we have what is called a snag list. Um, and the idea is it does a couple of things. So it removes blame. So rather than be like, oh, that's your fault, you've not done this sort of thing or, or any general reaction at that point, it's a case of let's get it in the snag list. Let's just fix the problem right now. And then as a team, every Monday, we review the snags. Um, and it's again, it's not a finger pointing exercise. It's a case of, hey, guys, here's what happened. How do we think the process can be improved? Because nine times out of 10, it just comes down to a process issue. Um, so all that's happened is for us is just consistently over the, you know, the 12 years that we've been going is we're just constantly tweaking it, constantly improving it. And, and processes that, you know, I'm very honest with, you know, probably five, even five, six years ago, there was a whole step of a process that probably just wasn't even done because it was just in someone's head. And they were like, oh, yeah, and then I do this. Um, and it's not until you start to grow and you realize that one person can't always do that. And then that area needs to be processed. So I guess it's like a two part is get down what you think is the process to start with. And you will 100% have missed loads of it. In all honesty, you probably missed 50% of the process that you do, but at least you've got a starting point. And then all that generally seems to happen uh, with us at Strafe is over time, if, something, if anything needs to be tweaked or changed, and then you realize it's not fully documented in the process, you can just add that in. And it just starts to expand them. So I think, for example, our, our, you know, for a start to finish web process now takes about 60 main steps. But then inside some of those steps, there might be five or six individual smaller steps that has to happen. And that definitely did start as that. That used to probably look something like do the pre-work, do a design stage, build it, QA it, launch. And then obviously over time, it's become this, this big thing. But I think if you try and go in straight away, and plan it out absolutely perfectly you'll waste longer doing it that way it's almost better just get it down basically on paper and organically start to flesh it out it just needs to be a consistent thing so ours is every monday yeah i've tried um i've tried doing that for my podcast you know the steps that i go through to from start to finish so you know once i've um, got the, the thing from the um the guest and all the paperwork and everything and all the contact that goes through with that and I think uh, I get really bored with it, so I just stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if yeah. someone had to come and take over or, or I outsource this, really they wouldn't be, have a clue. And it's really difficult too when you're in an ageing uh, in a workplace that has an ageing population and they keep mm. all that information to themselves because they're frightened they'll lose their job if they tell yeah. somebody. So, you know, how, how can it be, how, I mean, I understand it's a silly process to keep things to yourself. Um, yeah. Because information sharing is, you know, how businesses grow. But, you know, how can we get that and drag that information out of somebody? Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of that will come down to like the culture of the business. Like I can appreciate that, you know, I've probably been in companies beforehand where it was all like looking out for yourself. So therefore, well, I'll hold that together. I figured this thing out, so I'll just hold on to that because that will get me further in the business. Whereas if you're naturally in a company where people are constantly sharing ideas and processes on, oh, jump in and do this with me, I think a lot of that will naturally breed. Now, you'll probably still end up with one or two people who will just hoard information and keep it to themselves. But uh, for us anyway, that's probably not the sort of person that we want working at Strafe. Um, so that's one part. And then the second part is, which probably ties a little bit in with this, is just it's almost making sure that person feels supported to be able to, to provide some of that information. If they constantly just feel like they're being taken advantage of or they're the only person that can do it, if you know there's only one person that can do it and you never go to them to try to eke it out of them, like understandably, they'll probably just hold on to it even more because they're like, wow, well, you can never get rid of me. Whereas if you give them that support and maybe explain to them that the reason you're doing this is because you've got more plans for them to do other things where they're not always doing the same thing. And we've got long-term ideas about how they can be involved in the business. For me, that, that makes the most sense. So a lot of it is more about the mentality and the management of that person to get that out of them. But, um, but yeah, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, it's, it's not an easy process. I thought perhaps you might no, have no. an idea. <laughs> yeah, poke them. Poke them with a sharp poke stick. Poke them, that's it, yeah. If not, <laughs> there you go, do that one. That's it. So I've noticed also that you won some awards and, and so forth. So congratulations on, on ah, uh, thank all, you those, very much. all of those. And um, we've, we've dealt with your book, so we're all past all that. Um, let me say, I'm just going through your resume here at the moment. It's really, really impressive, the businesses that you've worked with. And um, 
you know, you've worked with Experian and the NHS and London Tobacco Doc Event Centre, and mm. um, you've been listed on the prestigious Drum Recommends Agency database, um, and they won Best Website in the UK Business Awards for their work. You also mm -hmm. work for a not-for-profit, or you've done work for them, um, you know, building their uh, workflows, wireframes, and, and their digital components, and that's yes. pretty impressive too. It's... Um, so you've that, done it work I think for that one in particular. Places. Sorry? Sorry. I was going to say that one in particular is, a, I guess, a, a lot all happened because of the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a charity called Open Kitchens. Yeah. Uh, and then we, one of our, I guess, biggest clients um, was and still is a restaurant booking engine. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously COVID happened, everything locked down, their main way of making money, all of their staff had nothing to do, none of the restaurants did. Um, but they had obviously incredibly good connections into, I guess, you know, restaurants and uh, a few different areas. And one of the things that was happening, and um, I'm sure you had this um, with, with the COVID situation, is everything locks down, but people don't, don't consider some of the other ramifications of what will happen is. So the farmers have already prepped all this food. So there's huge food waste. You had huge amounts of companies that only sold to restaurants. So it's not like they could just go, oh, we'll sell more to a supermarket or they'll sell somewhere else. So they had all of this kind of extra food that just was basically being wasted. You then had all of these restaurants who were twiddling their thumbs. Yes, everyone was on furlough. So they were in theory getting some pay, but they just had nothing to do. They weren't sharpening their skills. They were, um, I guess, mentally probably quite draped. And then you had all these other people who were either on zero hour contracts or um, weren't making any money anymore or you had people who were very reliant on going to a charity or very basically very vulnerable people um, and then you also had I guess you know you've got all these other storage companies logistics companies that can't do anything anymore because they've got nothing to move around so we randomly had this idea where we would try connect all those dots um, and at the time we tried to just do it in Nottingham which is which is where we're based and the idea was, well, let's see if we can get a load of the free food. Let's see if we can get it to some restaurants. And yes, they're all furloughed, so they can't technically work, but they can work for a charity. They could go you know, volunteer. So we reached out to a couple of restaurants that we knew to see if they would volunteer and basically cook some of this food. The restaurants then allowed us to um, house all the food there. And then we linked in with some charities um, to basically get the food out to them because they could no longer do the food prep that needed to be done. And because they already had large databases of vulnerable people, they could then ship it out to everyone. Um, so it started out as like a one, two restaurant style thing. Uh, we ended up raising about half a million pounds. Um, we, I think we fed 420,000 people um, or meals anyway, not necessarily individual people. Um, we ended up getting, because we were making so much food, we then had the problems of we don't have anywhere to store it because the rest, obviously a restaurant isn't designed to house that amount of food. It's meant to obviously have its raw ingredients and then they get made. So we managed to get Hilton Hotels because they'd closed all of their hotels. Um, they gave us all of, their free, uh, all of their freezers. So we were able to use those as logistics hubs and then get them out. Um, so yeah, it became this little small idea that just slowly built out and it was yeah it was great so uh, I, I guess you might be just kind of touching on it okay it's very impressive though um to be able to get that all together uh, i don't know that that's happened here i know that everyone closed but i don't know that anyone actually uh worked out a system to help with charities and mm. you know get food out there to the people that were in need of it so yeah very, yeah. very impressive the um the major issue that we don't have is that <coughs> is a fellow ended everyone back to work and obviously all this stuff that we've done was completely reliant on volunteers so we managed to make everything that we we kind of paid for but after that it kind of it's it sat relatively dormant unfortunately but um it was, it was great when it kind of lasted and we, we did have about a year and a half yeah uh, well so yeah, but i mean great. it can always be resurrected if um you know if worse comes to worse again so mm. at least you know that it works and that um it's still there you can still use it so yeah, so it, it, it it does work. So that's yeah, it's tried and tried and tested already. So 
yeah, yeah maybe you no, should definitely. sell maybe you should sell that idea to other people <laughs> yeah we we did we have spoken to a couple of charities about them basically just taking on all the tech that we ended up building um and just seeing if they could make use of it because again it was one of those things that like i guess because we all came from a, a techie background it was kind of a case of well i don't really want to do all that manually so let's see if we can automate it and again going back to that kind of flow chart that was probably my main job i got given a probably a slightly pretentious title something like systems architect but um it just meant that i was in charge of these big flows and then as we realized that things didn't make sense we tweak the process and add to it and then we'd build little bits of software around it so but we got it down to a point where we even had like a little driver's app where uh, the charities could put in the places that needed to be done. They could be told where the food was, and the driver could, who was a volunteer, could just turn up, grab the food, and then drive it to the right places. So, um, so yeah, it was all kind of built out. But it's yeah, unfortunately, uh, it never really went anywhere. Uh, other yeah. than, obviously, we you know we, we did all this food and that was amazing. But um, but yeah, it's very much been dormant recently. Oh, that's a shame. It is a shame. Mm. I think it'd be a, a great benefit to um, organisations, especially not for profits, who you know are dealing with the homeless mm. and those in need. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. Anyway, we'll get off that subject. So you've got um, um, helping build digital design. Yeah, you build digital designs to help businesses for their workflows and whatever. So if, if you've got a, a process, you know, that maybe that um, people could take away with them that, uh, you know, they might be able to start to implement in their business that might make their uh, processes a little bit easier? Yeah, of course. Um, I think the first one, the most important one, a lot of it comes back to what is what is the purpose of the thing that we're trying to do. And I know that sounds really basic, but um, it's something that's hugely overlooked. So if we took like an example of like, okay, you're going to, you decided you want to redo your website, let's say, as an example, and we use that as a, a focal point. And this works for, B2B, B2C, e-commerce, non, you know, like it, it works across the, the board. But what generally happens is that people make the purpose far too um, open, far too broad. So the example that I would normally give is that someone might come to us and say, oh, we just need to generate more leads. So we just want people to contact us. Now, having the term of just contact us is super, super open. So for example, picking up the phone, uh, getting them to phone us. There's, and there might be an email address on the website. There might be an individual form that I can fill in. There may be an appointment booking system that I can then fill in. Now, all four of those are, in theory, ways that someone could contact us, but all of them are very different and they would hugely affect the process on the other side, in sales side. If we give the user too many options as well, then they just won't perform the action that we want them to perform. We generally find to increase conversion rate, it's much better to choose one of them. And we normally go like, you know, when you're doing a website, you normally talk to the marketing department, but actually the people you need to speak to are the salespeople because they'll be the ones that know. So for example, a salespeople might say, I don't want, I don't want them to call. I don't want them to call because I'm not prepped. Like I need to do a lot of research before I ring this person. Whereas other people might say, oh no, just get them on the phone. I can do the rest from there. Whereas some people might prefer a form fill so they can do a little bit of research beforehand and then call them back and be really educated and ready to go. So that's kind of why I talk about that overall purpose. Before you do anything, it, it basically, once you decide on that, everything else can get into place. So without that initial step, that's a really hard thing to do. So definitely purpose is really key. And then we would always say that you want to have a backup. So even if the main purpose we've already defined is we want them to fill in a form because we want their information to sell to them, not everyone is going to be ready and in that position to do that for whatever reason. So we always need to have a fallback, which is a lesser commitment for them than what we would just call the sub-purpose. And that might be um, a download of an option. It might be to join a social media community or a Slack community. It might be to download something in particular. But once you've got those, that's going to allow you um, to basically push as much traffic as you can. And then those people will naturally kind of split themselves, hopefully between one of the two, or the third one is obviously just leave, which is again, fine. Um, so once you've got those two defined, that's where you can then start to work backwards because it's like, well, there's our endpoints. <laughs> how do we get to that? And how do we fill all of those other elements in? Whereas I think people purposely go in and go like, they just keep it really woolly. And they're like, oh, well, you know, we just need to bring in more leads. So if you could do that for us, happy days. And then because no one's got that 100% defined, it's really hard to build any real like process around it. 
the other stage that we would always take someone through and i, I like to pretend these are a little bit like a, a secret sauce our special spices is um the idea of this objection hunting is what we call it internally and, and anyone can do this as well to be honest it's just time consuming to do but it's trying to figure out the reasons why someone doesn't buy which are more than just the usual um, so the usual things might just be, are they credible and do I like the look of them and have they worked with anyone in my industry before? But every individual company or industry will have some really clear objections that people probably won't get in touch with. And they might feel really basic, but most people don't bother to cover for them. So there's initial research stage, it's really, really key. So uh, an example of this, and again, there's probably different ones I could give. But um, one of these was we worked with a company that sold uh, hot tubs. And one of the things they were finding is they're, they're uh, obviously this was pre-COVID um, because now everyone wants a hot tub because everyone's stuck at home. But, but pre-COVID, you generally were finding it was a slightly older demographic that was going to buy them because they were coming to end of retirement. They wanted to have them to be able to kind of relax at home and they had a little bit of disposable money. So that was originally pre-COVID the, uh, uh, the kind of idea. Now, one of the things that we were finding when we did all of our research is a very common way of buying a hot tub is you turn up and you do something called a wet test. So you turn up, you try them out and see if you like them. And a lot of the things that we were finding on forums were a slightly older demographic didn't feel comfortable turning up, getting into a bathing suit or into their swimming shorts and then getting into a tub while someone who was probably a third of their age was stood there selling to them. They didn't feel comfortable with the opposite sex almost doing that. Um, now, obviously, when we learn that, that's great. But obviously, we can't just slap that on the website to say, choose a man or a woman. So you have to come up with like a really... <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah, do that would it be with, really with a hairy though. chest or hairy legs or whatever. Exactly. You know? You're just like, oh, I want, yeah, I want someone to be six foot tall, tanned to look at. Yeah, you can't do that sort of thing. So we obviously had to come up with a way where we could visually answer that objection um, to get more people to come through. So what we did is we spoke about the team members a lot more and about what they like and why they sell hot tubs and the hot tubs that they have and some of their interests. And then we tried to do it in a way of case of just like, hey, if you think there's someone that fits your bill or you're not worried, feel free to select that person from the drop down. And then we made sure that person um, like gave them the wet test. And that more than doubled conversion rate just in that one thing alone. Because all of a sudden it was a huge, it's one of those things like, you know, you would never think of without doing that research because we're all too busy just putting case studies out. We're all too busy just showing the logos of people that we work with that we don't necessarily consider some of these finer, maybe slightly less important details. So one that we discovered with design agencies is um, people, yes, they want to see the portfolio. They want to see that you're good. They want to see the size of the team to make sure that you, you know, you, you can look after them. But actually, a lot of them are very driven by what's the process that we're going to take them through. Um, they want to know if there's going to be realistic timescales and are we going to see all that? Because a lot of designers, I guess some creatives in general, are um, a little bit airy-fairy and they'll just, oh, well, you know, it's a creative process, so I need my time. I can't tell you how long it will take. So because we're so process-driven, we can give that information. So we make sure to reference that a lot in our marketing, and that makes a big difference. So it's doing this additional research. And one of the places to start is going on Google, literally looking up all of your competitors, both locally and nationally, and just have like a pros and cons list. So what are the stuff that they always talk about? What is some of the stuff that they reference? Oh, we do this better than any other, uh, you know, another company. Make that big list to start with. And that's going to give you some tangible information. The other one that we would always recommend is basically typing in your industry and then typing in reviews, and basically just looking at what people are saying because testimonials and reviews are they give so much detail in there. Even for an e-commerce product, someone might talk about the build quality was much better than so and so. So if someone's repeatedly saying that, then we should be referencing that in our in our content. And you'll also find that in bad reviews where people talk about the, the poor things that happened and why they get a bad review. And that's really useful information that you can then make sure, A, that you're, you're not doing, and B, that you can mark it in a set way. And then the other one I always, I've always already kind of touched on is forums are a great, or social media or communities, if you can join anything that's about that niche and see what they're discussing. That's a really great place to just pull out. And the idea is that what we do is we just make a big old couple of pages of all of this information. And then we just try to visually figure out how we might answer some of those things. So that's a a kind of a nice, probably an overly long answer to your question. You know, you do that. 
well then yeah it's now it's great it's um it's a really great process and uh it, it would be good if we all did it so this is why we there's agencies like yours to go and do it mm. for us <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, so I realised it was probably quite a long answer there. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's the big thing for us. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Ross, where, where can people work with you if, um, I mean, where could people find you if they want to work with you? Uh, so obviously the, the, the most obvious one is our website, which is strafecreative.co.uk, and that's spelled Sierra Tango Romeo Alpha Foxtrot Echo. So strafe, then the word creative.co.uk. You can find us there. Uh, easiest thing, and one thing I did want to offer, so I hope this is okay, is if they do go on to our project planner, they reference this podcast. One of the things that we'll do is we'll get one of the designers to record a video around, around their website and give them some ideas about how they might improve it from a conversion aspect. So as long as they mention kind of your your podcast, we'll, we'll happily do all that sort of work for free. Oh, wow, that's very generous. Thank you so much. Um, that's all right. It's nice to do. Uh, other one is probably on Twitter, which is uh, Ross underscore Davis. And Davis is D-A-V-I-E-S. Can they get a copy of your book from your website? Yeah, so the, the book's on Amazon. is probably the best place to get it. I think it's on all of them. And uh, yeah, the best place is to get it there. And one thing that I kind of forgot to mention is it's obviously got a really random name. So obviously the paper plane plan is, um, is, related to our, is actually related to our logo so because it's a, a paper plane. And so if, if you're wondering why the random name of the book, it talks about the growth hacking techniques that we apply to Strafe Creative. Uh, so yeah, it's on it's on Amazon and it's on all of the Amazons as, as far as I know. And you can even get it on Kindle as well. Well done. Okay, I'll go and seek it out. <laughs> yes, thank you. That'd be great. All right. Any last words of wisdom and then I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, words of wisdom. I'm aware, I'm aware you could have asked this, uh, I guess, for pre one. So the, the only real one that I always kind of put down that, I feel like I'm constantly saying to the staff is, uh, is great is better than perfect. So, and that doesn't mean that the quality should be bad. It just means that it's much better to get it out there, trial it, see if it works, rather than spend another two weeks making it absolutely perfect to then launch it and find that you still need to tweak it anyway. So a lot of what we'll be doing, especially with testing, is, is like, let's just get it out there, see what the data tells us, and then we can tweak it from there. So definitely a, a great is better than perfect would be my... Absolutely, one. I totally agree with that. Yeah, being a ex perfectionist, yes, I can <laughs> so relate to that. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, Ross. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn about processes that your business does, and I'm sure our viewers and listeners will um, be inspired to um, to upgrade their processes in in the, in the long term. Amazing. Obviously, thank you so so much for having me. Have a great one. Thank you so much, Rose. Cheers. Talking with the experts.